The Shirangama Sutra, Fascicle 2 of 10. Chapter 1 The Numenon in the Tathagata Store. Actual Inversion The Heretic's Inverted View of Annihilation. After Ananda and the whole assembly had heard the Buddha's words, their bodies and minds became calm and composed. They thought that, since the time without beginning, they had lost sight of their own minds by wrongly clinging to the shadows of their differentiated causal conditions, and that they had only now awakened to all this, like a hungry baby who had not suckled for some time and suddenly saw its loving mother. They brought their palms together to thank the Buddha and wished to hear his teaching on the dual states of reality and unreality, existence and non-existence, and mortality and immortality of body and mind. King Prasenajit then rose and said to the Buddha, Before I received the Buddha's instruction, I met Kakuda, Katyayana, and Sanjaya, Varatiputra, who both said that when the body died, its annihilation was called Nirvana. Although I have now met the Buddha, I am still not clear about this. All those here who are still in the stream of transmigration wish to know how to realize that mind and proof that it is beyond birth and death. The Buddha said to King Prasenajit, Great King, I now ask you about your body of flesh and blood. Is it permanent? and indestructible like a diamond? Or does it change and decay? The king replied, My body will decay and finally be destroyed. The Buddha asked, Great king, you have not yet died. How do you know that your body will be destroyed? The king replied, Word honored one, though my impermanent, changing and decaying body is not yet dead, I observe that it changes and decays without a moment's pause, and is bound to go out like a fire that gradually burns out and will be reduced to naught. The Buddha asked, Yes, great king, you are old now, but how do you look compared to when you were a child? The king replied, World honored one, when I was a child, my skin glowed, and when I grew up, I was full of vigor. But now I age and weaken. I grow thin and my spirits are dull. My hair is white and my face wrinkled, so that I know I shall not live much longer. There is no comparison between now and when I was full of vitality. The Buddha said, Great King, your appearance should not decline. The King replied, World Honored One, it has been changing all the time too imperceptibly for me to notice it. With the constant change of seasons, I have become what I am now. Why? Because when I was twenty, though still young, I already looked older than when I was ten, while at thirty I was older still. As I am now sixty-two, I am older than at fifty when I was stronger. World Honored One, I notice this imperceptible change in every decade, but when I look into it closely, I see that it has occurred not only yearly, monthly, and daily, but in each moment of thought. That is why I know that my body is destined to final destruction. The Buddha said, Great King, you observe this ceaseless change and know that you will die. But do you know that when you do, there is that which is in your body and does not die? The king brought his two palms together and said, I really do not know. The Buddha continued, I will now show you the self-nature which is beyond birth and death. Great king, how old were you when you first saw the Ganges? The king replied, When I was three, my mother took me to worship the Deva Jiva. As we crossed the river, I knew it was the Ganges. The Buddha said, Great King, as you just said, you were older at twenty than at ten, and until you were sixty, 
As days, months, and years succeeded one another, your body changed in every moment of thought. When you saw the Ganges at three, was its water the same as it was when you were thirteen? The king replied, It was the same when I was three and thirteen, and still is now that I am sixty-two. The Buddha said, as you now notice your white hair and wrinkled face, there must be many more wrinkles than when you were a child. Today, when you see the Ganges, do you notice that your seeing is old now, while it was young then? The king replied, It has always been the same, world honored one. The Buddha said, Great king, though your face is wrinkled, the nature of the essence of your seeing is not. Therefore, that which is wrinkled changes, and that which is free from wrinkles is unchanging. The changing is subject to destruction, whereas the unchanging fundamentally is beyond birth and death. How can it be subject to your birth and death? Why do you bring out Maskari Go Shaliputra's wrong teaching on total annihilation at the end of this life? Upon hearing this, the king realized that after death there will be no annihilation, but life again in another transmigration. He and the whole assembly were happy and enthusiastic at the teaching which they had never heard before. The Inverted Behavior After hearing this, Ananda rose from his seat, prostrated himself before the Buddha, brought his two palms together, and knelt saying, World Honored One, if both seeing and hearing are beyond birth and death, why has the Buddha said that we have lost sight of our true nature and so acted in an inverted manner? Will you be compassionate enough to enlighten us and so wash off our defiling dust? Thereupon the Buddha lowered his golden-hued arm with the fingers pointing downward and asked Ananda, as you now see my hand, is it in a correct or inverted position? Ananda replied, All worldly men regard this as inverted, but I myself do not know which position is correct or inverted. The Buddha asked, If they hold that it is inverted, which position do they consider to be upright? Ananda replied, If the Buddha holds up his hand pointing to the sky, it will be upright. The Buddha then held up his hand and said, If worldly men so discriminate between an upright and inverted hand, they will in the same way differentiate between your body and the Buddha's pure and clean Dharmakaya, and will say that the Tathagata's body is completely enlightened, whereas yours is upside down. If you look closely into your body and the Buddha's, where is this so-called inversion? After hearing this, Ananda and the assembly were bewildered and gazed fixedly at the Buddha without knowing whether their bodies and minds were really inverted. Delusion and enlightenment are of the same source. The Buddha was moved with compassion and, out of pity for Ananda and the assembly, said in his voice as steady as the ocean tide, Virtuous men, I have always declared that form and mind and all causes arising therefrom, all mental conditions and all causal phenomena are but manifestations of the mind. Your bodies and minds are just appearances within the wonderful, bright, and pure, profound mind. Why do you stray from the precious, bright, and subtle nature of fundamentally enlightened mind and so recognize delusion within enlightenment? Mind's dimness creates dull emptiness, and both, in the darkness, unite with it to become form. The mingling of form with false thinking causes the latter to take the shape of a body, stirred by accumulated causes within and drawn to externals without. Such inner disturbance is mistaken for the nature of mind. Hence, the false view of a mind dwelling in the physical body, and the failure to realize that this body, as well as external mountains, rivers, space, and the great earth, are but phenomena within the wondrous bright, true mind. Like an ignorant man who overlooks on the great ocean, 
but grasps at a floating bubble and regards it as a whole body of water in its immense expanse. You are doubly deluded amongst the deluded. This is exactly the same delusion as when I hold my hand down. And so the Tathagata says that you are the most pitiable people. Refuting the false perception to eliminate the fourth aggregate and reveal the non-existence of the seventh consciousness. Wiping out the unreal. The non-existence of discriminative perception. Ananda's wrong view. Ananda was moved to tears by the Buddha's compassion and profound teaching, brought his two palms together and said, After hearing the Buddha's wonderful Dharma, I have realized that the wondrous bright mind is fundamentally perfect so that I always dwell in my mind ground. But if my awakening has been due to the Buddha's preaching, I have really used my causal mind to hear it with reverence, thereby realizing that mind. I dare not pretend that it is the fundamental mind ground. Will you be compassionate enough to enlighten me so as to remove my remaining doubts so that I can return to the Supreme Tao? Unreality of Illusory Causes The Buddha said, You are still using your clinging mind to listen to the Dharma. Since, however, this Dharma is also causal, you fail to realize the Dharma nature. This is like a man pointing a finger at the moon to show it to others who should follow the direction of the finger to look at the moon. If they look at the finger and mistake it for the moon, they lose sight of both the moon and the finger. Why? Because the bright moon is actually pointed at. They both lose sight of the finger and fail to distinguish between the states of brightness and darkness. Why? because they mistake the finger for the bright moon and are not clear about brightness and darkness. Likewise, if you mistake your intellect, which hears my preaching voice for your true mind, the latter's discerning nature should be independent of that differentiated voice. For instance, when a traveler spends the night in an inn, he does so for a time and then leaves, not staying there forever. As to the innkeeper, he has nowhere else to go, for he owns the inn. It is the same with your mind. Falseness of both sense organs and consciousness. If it is your true mind, it has nowhere to go. Then why, in the absence of speech, has it no discerning nature of its own? This discriminating intellect does not arise only when I speak, but also when you discern my appearance. It has no discerning nature of its own when there is no form. It is not true mind, even when you reach the state in which all discrimination ceases, a state that is neither form nor voidness, which the heretics call primordial darkness. All phenomena returnable to causes are unreal. If that which has no discerning nature of its own ceases to exist in the absence of causal conditions, how can the so-called nature of your mind be an independent host if it disappears when it returns to its illusory causes? Borrowing the essence of perception to pick out causal externals. Ananda asked, If every state of my mind can be returned to its cause, why does the Buddha speak of the wondrous, bright, original mind, which is not returnable to anywhere? Will you be compassionate enough to enlighten me? Setting up the essence of perception. The Buddha said, As you see me now, the essence of your seeing is originally clear. Although it is not the profound, bright mind, it is like a second moon, but it is not a reflection of the moon in water. Now listen attentively to my explanation of that which cannot return anywhere. Picking out causal externals. Ananda, the doors and windows of this hall are wide open and face east. There is light when the sun rises in the sky, and there is darkness at midnight when the moon wanes or is hidden by fog or clouds. Your seeing is unimpeded through open doors and windows, but is obstructed where there are walls or houses. 
where there is discrimination, you perceive the stirring causes, and in the dull void, you only see emptiness. An unconscious condition results from confused externals, whereas an awakened state leads to clear perception. Ananda, see now how I return each of these changing states to its causal origin. What are these original causes? Ananda, of these changing conditions, light can be returned to the sun. Why? Because there is no light without the sun, and since light comes from the sun, it can be returned to it, that is, its origin. Darkness can be returned to the waning moon, clearness to open doors and windows, obstruction to walls and houses, causes to differentiation, emptiness to relative voidness, confused externals to unconsciousness, and clear perception to the awakened state. Nothing in the world goes beyond these conditions. Now, when the essence of your perception confronts these eight states, where can it be returned to? If to brightness, you will not see darkness when there is no light. Although these states, such as light, darkness, etc., differ from one another, your seeing remains unchanged. The Nature of Perception All states that can be returned to external causes are obviously not you. But that which cannot be returned to anywhere, if it is not you, what is it? Therefore, you should know that your mind is fundamentally wonderful, bright, and pure, and that because of your delusion and stupidity, you have missed it, and so are caught on the wheel of transmigration, sinking and floating in the samsaric sea. This is why the Tathagata says that you are the most pitiable of men. The underlying nature of perception is not the essence of perception. Ananda asked, I now understand that the nature of perception cannot be returned to any external cause, but how can I know that it is my true nature? The Capacity of Perception The Buddha said, Ananda, though you have not reached the state beyond the stream of transmigration, you may now use the Buddha's transcendent power to behold the first dhyana heaven without obstruction. Like Aniruddha, who sees this world, Jambudvipa, as clearly as fruit held in his own hand. Bodhisattvas can see hundreds and thousands of worlds. Buddhas in the ten directions can see all the pure lands, as countless as the dust. As to living beings, their range of sight is sometimes limited to inches. Picking out causal objects. Ananda, as you and I see the palaces inhabited by the four heavenly kings, with all that is there in water, on the ground, and in the air, Though there is a great variety of forms and shapes in the light and darkness, they are but hindrances resulting from your differentiation of objective phenomena. Here you should distinguish between your own self and external objects. From what you see, I now pick out that which is your own self, and those which are but phenomena. Ananda, if you exhaust the field of your vision, from the sun and moon to the seven mountain ranges, with all kinds of light, all that you see are phenomena which are not you. As you shorten your range, you see passing clouds and flying birds, the wind rising, and dust, trees, mountains, rivers, grass, men, and animals. They are all external and are not you. The Essence of Perception Ananda the great variety of things, far and near, when beheld by the essence of your seeing, appeared different, whereas the nature of your seeing is uniform. This wondrous, bright essence is really the nature of your perception. The Essence of Perception Mistaken for Externals Refuting this misconception If seeing is an object, you should also see my seeing. If you can do so, why, when I do not see things, do you not see my non-seeing? Even if you do so, it will not be real, but your false seeing. 
If you do not see my non-seeing, it follows that your seeing and mine are not objects. If so, why cannot your seeing be you? Again, if when you see an object, you grasp at it as such, it should also see you. If so, that object in the nature of seeing will mingle, and you and I and the world will be in complete confusion. True Perception Ananda, when you see things, this seeing is yours and not mine, and its nature penetrates everywhere. If it is not you, what is it? Why do you still doubt about your real nature and ask me to confirm that it is not false? Wiping out the capacity of perception to reveal the true mind. The capacity of seeing. Ananda asked, World Honored One, if I am the nature of seeing, then why, when the Buddha and I saw the palaces of the four heavenly kings and the sun and the moon, did this seeing first penetrate the whole world and then return to this Vihara, then to its temple, and now to this hall with its eaves and corridors? Does this seeing, which first pervaded the universe, now return to and fill only this hall? Does its previous scale not shrink, or is it cut up by the walls of this hall? I do not know where the meaning of all this really lies. Will you be compassionate enough to enlighten me? Breaking up the capacity of seeing the Buddha replied, Ananda, all things in this world, whether large or small, inner or outer, as well as in other conditions, are external. You should not say that your seeing expands and contracts. Take for instance a square box, the inside of which is seen as containing a square of air. Now tell me, is the air seen as square in the square box? Really square or not? If so, it should not be round when poured into a round box. If not, then there should be no square of air in the square box. You say that you do not know where the meaning of all this really lies, but the meaning being so, where do you want it to lie? Ananda, if you want the air to be neither square nor round, just throw the box away. Since air has no location, you should not again insist on removing the place where it lies. If, as you just said, when you entered this hall, your seeing shrank into a small compass, then when you look at the sun, do you lift it up to reach that sun in the sky overhead? If a wall can cut off your seeing, can you prevent it from peeping through a hole in the wall? Therefore, your contention is wrong. Revealing the Real All living beings, from the time without beginning, have disregarded their own selves by clinging to external objects, thereby missing their fundamental minds. Thus, they are being turned round by objects and perceive large and small sizes. If they can turn objects round, they will be like the Tathagata, and their bodies and minds will be in the state of radiant perfection. From their immutable holy sight, the end of each of their hairs will contain all lands in the ten directions. Removing the essence of perception to wipe out the fifth aggregate and eighth consciousness. Eradicating attachment to the ego to reveal the one reality. Ananda asked, If this essence of seeing is my wondrous nature, the latter should manifest before me. If seeing is my real ego, then what are my body and mind? But in fact, my body and mind can discern things, whereas that seeing cannot discern my body. If perception is my mind and causes me to see things, then this perception is my ego, whereas my body is not. This is exactly what the Buddha previously refuted with the argument that objects should then see me. Will you be compassionate enough to enlighten me? Rooting out Ananda's misconception of objects being and not being perception. Misconception of objects 
being perception? The Buddha replied, Ananda, your conception of perception being in front of you is incorrect, because if it is, the essence of perception should have a position which can be shown. As you sit in Jetavana Park, you see its trees and nullas as well as this hall, with the sun or moon overhead and the Ganges in the distance. As you are now in front of my lion seat, moving your hand to point out the surroundings, such as the dark foliage of the wood, the bright sun, blocking walls and clear open spaces, as well as grass, plants, and very small things, although they are of different sizes, each of them can be pointed out. If they are really your seeing manifesting in front of you, you should be able to show which one is your seeing. Ananda, you should know that if voidness is your seeing, since it has already become your perception, then how can it be empty? If an external thing is your seeing and has already become your perception, how can it be external? So, after dissecting all things in front of you, pick out the bright and pure principle of your perception and show it to me to prove that it is clearly and irrefutably identical with externals. Ananda said, From this hall I now see the Ganges in the distance, the sun or moon overhead, and all that I can point out with my finger and see with my eyes. They are all external things, but not one of them is my perception. World Honored One, as the Buddha has said, not only a beginner in the Shravaka stage, like myself, who is still in the stream of transmigration, but even a bodhisattva cannot dissect things and pick out the essence of seeing which has an independent nature apart from the phenomena. The Buddha said, Correct! Correct! Misconception of objects not being perception. The Buddha said, As you have said, there is no essence of seeing with an independent nature apart from phenomena. Now, if there is no perception in the things you point out, I now ask again, as you and the Tathagata sit in this Jetavana park, when you see the wood and all externals, including the sun and moon, if there is no essence of seeing which can be picked out from them, tell me which one is not the seeing. Ananda replied, Of all things seen in this Jetavana park, I do not know which one is not the seeing. Why? Because if the trees are not the seeing, why do I see them? If they are the seeing, why are they trees? If the void is not the seeing, why do I see it? If the void is the seeing, why is it empty? I too have thought carefully about all this and now conclude that each one of them is the seeing. The Buddha said, Correct! Correct! In the assembly, all those who had not achieved the stage beyond study were very surprised at hearing the Buddha say this. They failed to understand his meaning and were perturbed and thrown off balance. The Buddha realized their perplexity and alarm and took compassion on them, saying, Virtuous men, the words of the King of the Supreme Law are true, accord with reality, and are neither deceitful nor false unlike those of the heretics whose sermons are arbitrary and aimless. Now listen attentively. Your faith in me shall not be in vain. Manjusri's Helpful Interposition Thereupon, Manjusri Bodhisattva, who took compassion on the four Varga, rose from his seat, prostrated himself at the Buddha's feet, brought his two palms together, and said, World Honored One, these people do not understand the Tathagata's twofold revelation of the reality and unreality of the essence of perception in form and voidness. They think that if causal form and voidness are the seeing, there should be an indication of it, and if they are not, there should be no seeing. They do not understand your teaching and are therefore surprised and bewildered but they are not like those whose roots are frivolous and inferior. May the Tathagata be compassionate enough to enlighten them, so that they know 
what objects and this essence of perception are fundamentally, and that there exists neither is nor is not between them. The Buddha declared to Manjushri and the assembly, To all Tathagatas and great Bodhisattvas of the Ten Directions, abiding in the state of Samadhi, seeing and its concurrent causes, as well as all forms imaginable, are like flowers in the sky, which fundamentally do not exist. This seeing and its causes are essentially the profound, pure, and bright substance of enlightenment. How can there be is and is not within it? Manjushri, I now ask you this. You are already the real Manjushri. Can there be another Manjushri who first is and then is not? Manjushri replied, No, world-honored one. I am the real Manjushri, and there cannot be another. Why? Because if there is, then there will be two Manjusris. But my presence here does not mean that there is no Manjusri, with an arbitrary conception of is and is not in between. The Buddha said, Likewise, this clear seeing, as well as the object seen and the void, are fundamentally the perfect, pure, true mind of the wonderful, bright, supreme Bodhi, wrongly perceived as form and voidness, as well as hearing and seeing. Just as a second moon is perceived with the accompanying misconception of real and unreal moons. Manjushri, there is only one real moon, which is beyond the condition of is and is not. Therefore, if you discern seeing and its objects and give rise to all kinds of mental creation, this is wrong thinking, which will prevent you from getting out of this dual condition of is and is not. If you look into them by means of this true, essential, wonderful, bright, and enlightened nature, it will enable you to avoid this duality. Wiping out Elias self-evidencing to reveal one reality. Ananda's discrimination. Ananda said, World honored one, the king of the law has preached the nature of causal enlightenment, Bodhi, which is always present in the ten directions, and which is beyond birth and death. Does this differ from the concept of primordial profundity according to the doctrine of Capilla, and that of a true ego pervading everywhere, according to heterodox ascetics who cover their heads with ashes and dust? The Buddha, while on Lanka Mountain, once said to Mahamati, Heretics always speak of natural existence, but I preach causes and conditions which are beyond the stage they have reached. Now, as I look into this nature of enlightenment, it is self-existent, above birth and death, and beyond all falsehood and inversion. There seem to be neither your causes and conditions, nor their natural existence. Will you please teach us, so that we shall not fall into heresies, but win the bright nature of wonderful, enlightened, true mind? Wiping out Ananda's discrimination. Rooting out the self as such. The Buddha said, I have expediently revealed the truth to you, yet you do not waken to it, but mistake it for being the self as such. Ananda, if it is the self as such, it should show clearly that its substance is the self. Now look into this wondrous seeing and see what is its self. Do you mean that light, darkness, clarity, or obstruction is its self? Ananda, if light is its self, you should not see darkness, and if the void, you should not see obstructions. If darkness is its self, the nature of your seeing should cease to exist when there is light. If so, why do you still see light? Ananda said, If so, the nature of this wondrous seeing is not the self as such. I now guess that it is created by cause and condition, but I am still not clear about it. I pray the Tathagata to teach me how this accords with the nature of cause and condition. Eliminating Cause and Condition 
the Buddha said. You now speak of cause and condition. Let me ask you this. When you see things, the nature of seeing manifests. Does this seeing exist because of light, darkness, clarity, or obstruction? Ananda, if it exists because of light, you should not see darkness. And if because of darkness, you should not see light. It is the same with clarity and obstruction. Again, is this seeing in a bright, dark, clear, or obstructed condition? Ananda, if it is clear, you should not see any obstruction. And if it is obstructed, you should not see that it is clear. It is the same with light and darkness. Revealing the Essential Bodhi Therefore, you should know that the essential Bodhi is wondrous and bright, being neither cause nor condition, neither self as such nor not self as such, neither unreality nor not unreality, and neither reality nor not reality. For it is beyond all forms and is identical with all things or dharmas. How can you now think of it and use the frivolous terminology of the world to express it? This is like trying to catch or touch the void with your hand. You will only tire yourself. For how can you catch the void? Brushing away wrong assumptions. Ananda asked, World Honored One, if the nature of wonderful enlightenment has neither cause nor condition, why has the Buddha always told the bhikshus about the nature of seeing, which exists because of the four conditions of voidness, light, mind, and I? What does all this mean? The Buddha replied, I spoke of worldly cause and condition which have nothing to do with supreme reality. Eliminating the essence of perception to reveal inceptive enlightenment. Wiping out Ananda's discrimination. Ananda, I now ask you this. When a worldly man says that he can see things, what does he mean by seeing and not seeing? Ananda replied, When a worldly man sees forms by the light of the sun, moon, and lamps, this is called seeing, but in the absence of such light, he cannot see anything. The Buddha asked, Ananda, if it is called not seeing when there is no light, he should not see darkness. If he does, this is because there is no light. How then can there be no seeing? Ananda, in the dark, if this is called not seeing solely because he does not see the light, then where there is light, if he does not see darkness, this is again called not seeing. Thus, there would be no seeing in both cases. But in these two states, which replace each other, the nature of your seeing does not cease for an instant. Therefore, there is actual seeing in both states. So how can there be no seeing? Revealing the Inceptive Bodhi Therefore, Ananda, you should know that when you see the light, your seeing is not clear. When you see the darkness, your seeing is not obscure. When you see the void, it is not empty. And when you see obstruction, it is not obstructed. After you have understood these four states, you should also know that when your absolute seeing perceives the essence of seeing, the former is not the latter, which still differs from it. How can your false seeing reach that absolute seeing? How can you speak of cause and condition, of the self existing as such, and of the so-called union? You are all ignorant and narrow-minded hearers or shravakas and cannot understand pure and clean reality. I now teach you the truth into which you should look carefully. So do not allow indolence and remissness to obstruct your path to profound bodhi. Revealing the unreality of the two realms to expose the non-existence of dharma or things. Ananda said to the Buddha, World Honored One, although the Buddha has taught us about cause and condition, the state of self as such, of mingling and union and of non-mingling and non-union, our minds are still not open to the teaching. As we listened to his further instruction on seeing that is not seeing, 
we became more deluded and perplexed. Please be compassionate enough to open our wisdom eye to enlighten us. After saying this, he shed bitter tears, prostrated himself at the Buddha's feet, and waited for the holy teaching. The Buddha took pity on Ananda and the assembly, and was about to teach the profound practice of the Samadhis of the great Dharani, when he said to Ananda, Though you have tried to memorize my Dharma, you have only broadened your hearing or knowledge, and are still not very clear about deep insight into Samatha. Now listen with attention to what I now tell you fully for the benefit of you and those who are still in the stream of transmigration so that you can all win the Bodhi fruit. Ananda, all living beings are subject to transmigration through various worlds because of two inverted discriminative and wrong views which, wherever they occur, cause people to be caught in the turning wheel of samsara. What causes these two wrong views? They are due to their individual and collective karmas. Individual Karma What is the individual karma that causes wrong views? Ananda It is like a man who, because his eyes are inflamed, sees at night a five-colored circle round the light of a lamp. Is this circle the color of the flame or that of his seeing? If it is the color of the flame, why does only the man with bad eyes see it, while others do not? If it is the color of his seeing, since his seeing is already that color, what do you call the circle? Moreover, Ananda, if this circle is independent of the lamp, the man should see it when looking at nearby curtains, tables, and mats. If it is independent of the seeing, it should not be seen by the eyes. But why does the man with bad eyes see it? Therefore, you should know that this color is revealed by the lamplight and becomes a circle when perceived by defective seeing. Both the circle, or form, and the seeing, or perception, are due to bad eyes. But that which recognizes this disease is not sick. Thus, you should not discriminate and say that it is either the lamp or the seeing, with the further idea of it being neither the lamp nor the seeing. It is like a second moon, which is neither the real moon nor its shadow. Why? Because the sight of this second moon is an illusory creation. So wise people should not say that this illusion is or is not form, or that it exists apart from seeing or non-seeing. In the same way, how can you prove that an illusion caused by bad eyes is due to the lamp or to your seeing? Still less can you establish that it is due to neither the lamp nor your seeing. Collective Karma What is the collective karma that causes wrong views? Ananda, this universe, Jambudvipa, comprises, beside the great sea, 3,000 continents, with the largest at the center, containing altogether from east to west 2,300 countries and other small continents, each consisting of 1, 2, 30, 40, 50, 200, or 300 countries. Ananda, in a small continent there may be only two countries, one of which is inhabited by people who, as a result of their evil karma, may witness all sorts of evil states while the inhabitants of the other country neither see nor even hear of them. Ananda, let us compare these two karmic conditions, dealing first with wrong views caused by individual karma, which are similar to those by collective karma. Ananda, all living beings whose individual karma causes them to see wrongly are like the man who, because his eyes are inflamed, sees round the light of a lamp a circle, which seems to be out there in front of him, but in fact exists because his sight is disturbed. This circle is not created by form. However, the faculty of seeing through which he is aware of this trouble is free from it. Similarly, if you now look at mountains, rivers, and the country with its inhabitants, they are all created by a disturbance in your seeing since the time without beginning. 
though this seeing and its causal externals seem to be phenomena in front of you, they originally arise from your subjective awareness of that brightness of reality which leads to a wrong perception of objective causal falsities. Thus, awareness and perception cause wrong seeing. But the bright true mind of basic Bodhi, which sees clearly these causal states, is free from all ills. That which realizes this awareness as faulty does not fall into delusion. This is what I mean by true seeing that is not discriminative, and about which you ask for elucidation? How can this be comprehended by your discriminative seeing, hearing, feeling, and knowing? Therefore, your actual seeing of yourself, of me, and of living beings of the ten types of birth is a disturbance of your seeing, and certainly not that which is aware of your wrong seeing. For the basic nature of the true essence of perception is beyond all ills. Hence, it is not called seeing. Ananda, let us now compare wrong seeing caused by collective karma with that by individual karma. The illusion of a circle round the light of a lamp seen by a man because his eyes are bad and the evil condition experienced by all the inhabitants of a country because of collective karma are both created by false seeing since the time without beginning. Thus the Jambudvipa's three thousand continents, the four great seas, the Saha world and Samsara countries in the ten directions, as well as their inhabitants, are the product of causal seeing, hearing, feeling, and knowing, which arise from the subjective awareness of the brightness of supramundane wondrous mind, entailing mixtures and unions of concurring causes which result in their rise and fall, revealing the independent basic Bodhi to expose the unfettered absoluteness or Buddha ta ta ta. He who can avoid the illusory mixture and union and non-mixture and non-union of concurrent causes will be able to destroy all causes of birth and death, thereby perfecting the transcendental nature of enlightenment and realizing the permanent basic Bodhi of pure and clean self-mind. Wiping out all traces of the false to enter the abstruse to reveal the Buddha ta ta ta. Ananda, though you have understood the profound and bright nature of basic Bodhi, which is neither causal nor conditional, nor the self as such, you are still not clear about this enlightened substance, which neither mixture and union nor non mixture and non union can create. Ananda, I must now ask you a question. Since you still hold that all false thinking mixes and unites with causes and conditions, you are in doubt and worry about the thoughts of a Bodhi mind arising from such mixture and union. If so, does your essence of perception mix with light or darkness, with clarity or obstruction? If it mixes with light, when the latter appears and you see it, where does it mix with your seeing? Since your seeing is clear, where can you find such mixture? If it is not the seeing, why do you see light? If it is the seeing, how can you see your own seeing? Since your seeing is complete by itself, how can it be mixed with the light? Since light is complete by itself, where can it contain your seeing? Therefore, seeing and light differ, and if they are mixed up, even the word light would cease to exist. In other words, such a mixture would suppress the light, Consequently, your concept of a mixture of seeing with light is wrong, and so is a mixture of seeing with darkness, clarity, and obstruction. Again, Ananda, does the essence of your perception unite with light, darkness, clarity, and obstruction? If it unites with light, then when the light vanishes and is replaced by darkness, the seeing should not unite with the latter. But why do you still see the darkness? When you see darkness, if your seeing does not unite with it, then when it unites with light, you should not see light as well. If light is not seen, then where there is light, do you know that it is light and not darkness? Likewise, a union of the seeing with darkness, clarity, and obstruction is equally false. Ananda asked, World Honored One, 
I am thinking again about this enlightened substance. Does it neither mix nor unite with causal externals and with the mind's thinking and discerning? The Buddha replied, You now speak of not mixing and not uniting. Do you mean that this essence of seeing does not mix with light, darkness, clarity, and obstruction? If so, then when you see the light, there should be a demarcation line between seeing and light. Now look carefully and tell me, where are the fields of light and of your seeing, and where are their boundaries? Ananda, if you do not see where light is, then your seeing will not reach it. If so, you will not even know where the light is, and how can there be a borderline? It is the same with darkness, clarity, and obstruction. Again, do you mean that this essence of seeing does not unite with light, darkness, clarity, and obstruction? If it does not unite with light, then both the seeing and light are in opposition, like your ears and the light which can never meet. So your seeing would not perceive anything where there is light. Then how can you cause them either to unite or not? It is the same with darkness, clarity, and obstruction. Direct Pointing to the One Mind Ananda, you are still not clear about the illusory appearances of all passing phenomena which vanish wherever they arise. These illusions in the shape of forms spring from their underlying nature, which is the substance of wonderful Bodhi. So also are the six entrances, or organs, the twelve ayatana, or six sense organs and six sense data, and the eighteen realms of senses which falsely arise from the mixture and union of causes and conditions, and which falsely vanish when the same causes and conditions are disconnected. They are but creation and destruction, appearing and vanishing, within the permanent, wonderfully bright, immutable, all-embracing and profound Buddha Tathata, or absolute nature of the Tathagata store, wherein neither coming nor going, neither delusion nor enlightenment, and neither birth nor death can be found. Fusing myriads of things with the absolute to reveal the identity of phenomenon with noumenon. Fusing the five aggregates. The first aggregate, Rupa. Ananda, why are the five aggregates fundamentally the wondrous nature of the absolute of the Tathagata store? Ananda, for instance, when a man looks at a clear sky with clear eyes, he sees only the void, which contains nothing. If suddenly, without any apparent reason, he steadies his seeing, it will be disturbed, and he will see flowers dancing and other objects moving in the sky. It is the same with the aggregate Rupa. Ananda, these dancing flowers come neither from the void nor from his eyes. If they came from the void, they would return to it. If there was really such a coming and going of these flowers, the void would not be empty. If voidness was really not empty, that is, if it was solid, then they could not appear and vanish in it. This is like Ananda's solid body, which does not allow another Ananda to enter it. If these flowers come from the eyes, they should be able to return to the eyes. And because they come from the faculty of seeing, they should be able to see things. Thus, when they leave the eyes, they become flowers in the sky, and when they return, they should see the organ of sight. If they cannot see things, then, when they leave, they should screen the sky, and when they return, they should veil the eyes. But when the man sees these flowers, his eyes are not veiled. Then why do you wait until the sky is clear of these flowers to say that your eyes are really clear? Therefore, you should know that the aggregate form is unreal, for it is neither causal nor conditional, nor self-existent. The second aggregate, Vedana. Ananda, when, for instance, a man is in good health and his limbs are in good condition, he does not feel anything. But if suddenly, without any reason, he rubs his palms together, he feels coarseness, smoothness, cold and warmth. It is the same with the second aggregate, Vedana. Ananda, these sensations come from neither the void nor his palms. 
If they come from the void, why are they felt by his palms only, and not by his body? It should not be up to the void to choose his palms to feel them. If they come from his palms, they should not wait for the palms to be brought together to be felt. Moreover, if they really come from his palms and are felt when the latter are brought together, when they are separated, those sensations should re-enter the palms, arms, shoulders, bones, and marrow, which should also feel their re-entry. They should also be felt by the mind, as coming in and out, as if something had moved in and out of the body. If so, there is no need to bring the two palms together to feel those sensations. Therefore, you should know that the aggregate Vedana is unreal and is neither causal nor conditional nor self-existent. The third aggregate, Sanjna. Ananda, if someone speaks of sour plums, your mouth will water, and if you think of walking above an overhanging cliff, you will have the sensation of shivering in the soles of your feet. This is the same with the third aggregate, Sanjna. Ananda, this talk of sourness does not come from the plum, nor does it enter your mouth. If it comes from the plum, it should be spoken of by the plum itself. Then why does it wait for someone to speak of it? If it enters your mouth, it should be your mouth which actually talks about it. Then why does it wait until your ears hear of it? If it is in your ears which alone hear it, why does not that water come out of them? This is the same with your thought of walking above an overhanging cliff. Therefore, you should know that the third aggregate sajna is neither causal nor conditional nor self-existent. The fourth aggregate, samskara. Ananda, the fourth aggregate, samskara, is like water which flows in a torrent endlessly and in good order over a fall. Ananda, this flow does not come from the void, nor is it due to the water. It is neither the water itself, nor does it exist apart from the void and the water. If it is created by the void, boundless space would become an endless flow of water and the whole world would be submerged. If it is due to the water, then it should not be water and should have its own form and location, which should be apparent. If it is water, then still and clear water should not be water. If it exists apart from the void and water, this is impossible, because space is all-embracing and has nothing outside it, and because there is no flow without water. Therefore, you should know that the fourth aggregate, samskara, is false and neither causal nor conditional nor self-existent. The fifth aggregate, vijnana. Ananda, the fifth aggregate, consciousness, is like the void in an empty pitcher with two mouths. If someone blocks both mouths and carries it to another country, the void does not go from one place to another. If the void comes from somewhere, that place should lose some of its voidness. And on arrival elsewhere, when the mouths are opened and the pitcher reversed, one should see the void poured out of it. Therefore, you should know that consciousness is unreal and is neither causal nor conditional nor self-existent. <laughs>